for the life of the world is a production of the Yale Center for Faith and Culture. Visit us online at faith.yale.edu. This episode was made possible in part by the generous support of the Tyndale House Foundation. For more information, visit tyndale.foundation. There's a kind of asymmetric dependence on God that all creatures enjoy. But that's also a sense in which God's life is extended in creatures. So the gratitude we owe to God is, is a gratitude of a kind of acknowledgement. We don't owe God a token return benefit. Rather than benefactor or beneficiary kind of relations, God is this transcendent and holy other. And what God gives creatures that merits our gratitude is manifestations of God's self, exercises of divine wisdom and power that are experienced as the kind of mysterious and surpassing goodness and beauty of creation. And to be a grateful recipient is not a, to be a beneficiary of some kind of super erogatory going over and above what God owes to us, but it's rather a, a divinely intended witness. We're kind of a witness and channel of God's holy presence. And so to acknowledge to God our appreciation for God's sharing is a kind of gratitude. So it's kind of thinking about acknowledgement and appreciation rather than death. This is For the Life of the World, a podcast about seeking and living a life worthy of our humanity. I'm Evan Rosa with the Yale Center for Faith and Culture. This is the obligatory gratitude podcast for the week before Thanksgiving. Thank you. You're welcome. But in all seriousness, here's to hoping that you're listening to this in the peace and rest and warmth of family and loving community. But I have to be honest about something. I'm not very good at thank you notes. Don't get me wrong. I I, I try my best to communicate verbally my gratitude for the people and for the gifts in my life. And I'm ever, often painfully, aware of my dependence on others, my need for them, my profound linkage to them. I'm fully aware of my creatureliness before God. But I feel pretty bad that when it comes to writing the note and formalizing the payment of my debt of gratitude, I falter. Part of the problem I gauge, besides the grossness of my narcissism, is that I feel so indebted, so obligated to do it, like my gratitude to you just doesn't count if I don't write the note. Or maybe that's less about the giver and more about the card or the transaction. I don't know. Excuses, but there's something wrong here. Yet I'm equally tempted to err in another way. Ever since I learned from positive psychology that I could hack my own thankfulness for happiness, I tend to exploit gratitude just to feel better. Our episode today will correct me on both counts, both for thinking of gratitude as something to be exploited for my personal well-being and for thinking of gratitude as a stale, robotic, transactional obligation. Today on the show, Samir Yadav, a theologian at Westmont College, joins Ryan McAnally Lins to reflect on a better way to understand gratitude than owing it being in debt to another person, seeing gratitude only through the dry indifference of a receiver's economic indebtedness to a giver. Gratitude as indebtedness creates problems, especially when thinking about gratitude to God. And the two consider instead a conception of gratitude based in sacrament and creatureliness, in mystical shared witness, in the meetness and rightness of thanks and praise, and a joyful recognition of the gifts in our lives. This understanding of gratitude would have truly seismic consequences for how we see the world. Thank you cards would no longer feel obligatory. Gratitude lists wouldn't have to be hacked for my subjective well-being. Instead, gratitude would just simply flow from the glad mutual sharing in the gift of life from God and the confident, joyful presence of being what we are to each other. And I would be remiss if I didn't take the opportunity to thank each of you, our listeners and subscribers, for joining us each weekend for these conversations on this podcast. It's our joy to produce them for you. And I don't even feel obligated to say that, not in the least. So I guess I was wrong to say remiss because that word means halting on a duty. Uh, That's why we need this episode. So how about this? Thanks for sharing in the gift of making this podcast. Enjoy. Samir, thanks for uh, taking some time to come back on For the Life of the World. It's good to talk to you. Yeah, likewise. Thanks a lot for having me. It should have occurred to me before, but it only just struck me now. The starting with thanks is perfectly appropriate for what we're here to talk about. Many gratitude jokes to come. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's I'm currently teaching a class on gratitude and 
thinking about the practice of thanks and just kind of how it works in our language and is there all the time, it actually makes it really hard to be normal. Everything needs some sort of recursive comment like this. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So so we've done that now. We can just get to some real conversation. I want to start by asking you about a kind of commonplace in the English language when it comes to gratitude language. And that's the phrase, a debt of gratitude. Why do you think that's such a common term? Why do you think that's a stock phrase? And what do you think of it? Is that a helpful way for Christians to be thinking about gratitude? Yeah, it does come as second nature, I think, to talk about gratitude in terms of debts. And there is a sense in which um, talking in terms of debts of gratitude that we owe to one another is natural because of the, na- of the language of obligation. That is to say, when we think about what we owe to one another, debts are the primary sort of thing we think of as owing. And indeed, the, the idea of a debt of obligation goes back um, quite a long way. That is to say, in the classical world, that's the way you get Seneca and Cicero and Roman context talking about obligations in terms of debts. And it's very much tied up, historically, the language of gratitude is very much tied up with political economy. So the way that we think about the the way that goods are distributed across Uh, a a population of people who belong in a community is often an economic matter that into which gratitude figures, you could say. So on the one hand, it's therefore really natural. And in fact, we find this in particularly the Christian tradition a lot, the language of debt to talk about gratitude. And contemporary philosophers who work on the emotions and spiritual emotions of gratitude, like Robert Roberts, I think of, for example, has a book on spiritual emotions. He has a chapter on gratitude, tries to analyze what the emotion of gratitude is. And likewise, he thinks of it as a certain kind of debt obligation that demands a kind of token return of benefit. And so it's in that kind of economic exchange. But to get into the, what do I think of it, I think it's a deeply problematic way of thinking about gratitude, both in terms of what dynamics it introduces into human relationships more generally. And then secondly, also more particularly, the language of gratitude in terms of debt is, I think, incongruous or ill-fitting with particularly Christian understandings of gratitude. All right. So let's actually just take that in turn. How do you think gratitude being bound up with debt shapes human relationships? Was it due to relationships there? And then we'll talk about the theological side of things later on. Yeah, sure. So uh, there's a few things you could say about the idea of co-opting the economy of economic transaction and debt obligation to talk about the relationships of gratitude as being worrying, I think that one place you you can identify a problem might be to think about the way that debts are understood in terms of money. And so David Graeber's book, he's got this book, Debt, The First 5,000 Years. It's a terrific work on thinking about the history of debt. And he says the difference between owing someone a favor And owing someone a debt is that the amount of debt can be precisely calculated. And so calculation demands a kind of equivalence. And equivalence involves relationship between human beings that seems to forcibly sever us from our contexts. And so what I mean by that is when you think about owing money, you think about the the what you owe to one another is something that can set be set at a remove from one's own personal circumstances, one's own life situation, and the forms of dependencies that we have on one another. And that abstraction actually obscures what matters about what we owe to one another, which is the forms of community we share. And so there's a sense in which problems that are sort of commonplace and critiques of capitalism tend to accrue to problems with gratitude as an economic notion. I was just thinking about the phrase getting down to dollars and cents. Mm -hmm. And so at some level, just intuitively, money presents itself as the most concrete thing. And what could be more concrete than the stuff that gets stuff done. But you presented that the kind of moving of gratitude into a semantic terrain that has to do with with money as being a matter of abstraction from yeah. relationships. Could, could you dig into that a little more? Sure. I, I, one way to get into it that um, 
just kind of pops immediately to mind is this recent article in the Christian Century called The Labor That Pays My Salary by a Mennonite pastor named Isaac Villegas. And he he's had, relates a story with a congregant. They're driving down the road and talking. And this congregant was a, is a sort of blue-collar type uh, person who works really hard for not really for very close to barely living wages kind of a situation. And Isaac reports feeling uneasy about, about the money he regularly gets from this congregant, knowing how difficult it is for this congregant to get by in their daily life. And it leads to a reflection on the way in which you might say that once, the, once money leaves the hands of the congregant and goes into the plate, then it doesn't matter whose hand it is. It's the money is what does the work of paying Isaac's salary, giving him the ability to sustain him and his family's life, that kind of thing. And it takes an extra step to know or to bother to know whose hand it came from, whether it's a person for whom it means nothing or for a person for whom it means a great deal to, to sacrifice that labor. So the labor gets translated into something that becomes separable from the person whose labor it is when in, in that form of money. And so it, it kind of calls to mind Jesus's whole thing about the widow and the two mites and the idea that there's a form of life and a, and a web of human connections that by which we uh, our lives are sustained and by which we sustain one another's lives that gets sort of becomes irrelevant in the economic transaction sort of fades back and the only thing that matters is the instrumental value of this sort of arbitrary thing that does that does the work that money does the work and this kind of standard worry about the way that that money figures to erode communal life in a certain kind of way, or it makes bonds of human relationship weakened in a community, that that applies to the way we think about gratitude as well. So that when you think about gratitude in a system of relationships that are governed by economic transaction, then gratitude can take on that same kind of abstraction. Even the way that we talk about gratitude as something we owe that then makes the notion of calculation and an equivalence of paying back kind of a relevant idea or of token benefit. That is to say, now I have to return something that even if it can't pay back what, what I owe to someone is a kind of like a tribute in the same sense that like a vassal state might give to a sovereign a tribute as an expression or something like that in some transactional way. These kinds of framings for thinking about gratitude can, I think, be subtly damaging to our relationship. I think you can see this in some of those early texts on gratitude that you were talking about. Seneca Seneca wants to divide really sharply the kind of internal spiritual thanks, the intention of gratitude from the kind of concrete benefit that's returned mm. for another benefit. And he's a stoic, so everything depends on this internal and the attention. At the same time, he can't seem to actually make the break. There's always that intention needs to be a real intention for a real return. And then the question of whether re the return is as good or as great as what was given comes in and it becomes a question of how do you calculate and you never have discharged your debt of gratitude until you can be confident that you've done everything you possibly could to give something of equal or greater value in return and you get you get similar patterns modulated christianly in in thomas aquinas and then you get someone like someone like immanuel kant who says that you can actually never do enough because if somebody's given you something they always will have done the good of going first and you could yeah. never get, you can never Thank pay that back. back. You're always just responding. And that caught one in particular feels to me like, man, if I started to think about my own relationships in that way, that could be pretty crushing. I could see yeah. how that would really distort my ability to relate to anybody. And, and it kind of my, my willingness to receive from anybody. Cause that's, that seems, it seems overly freighted. And this is why for Aristotle, right? Like, for Aristotle, gratitude is not a virtue for the magnanimous person because that it means you have to be placed in a position of owing somebody something, which is a sign that you're not in the optimal circumstance. So the best place to be is in a place of self-sufficiency where you can be a giver 
but not a receiver. And so there's something really closely connected to a hierarchical set of human relationships that is necessary for thinking in terms of this economic image of gratitude. And that's why it figures, at least in the ancient context, Seneca's and so on, as a form of social bonds that hold people together precisely in relationships of patronage and benefaction of superiors to inferiors. Even in Aquinas, he talks about gratia, God's grace that's given to us, as distinct from gratitudo, that he, the, the idea of our, our debts of obligations that we owe to one another. But he models gratitudo on the social and political subordination that we owe to superiors in the feudal kind of kind of context. That that way of thinking in terms of having to be in someone's debt is to be placed in a disadvantage of being being having a requirement of that kind of return that's owed to the one in whose debt we've been placed. And that makes gratitude a kind of unfortunate necessity. So so I'm gonna try out a possibility on you here. In talking about Aristotle on the magnanimous man. You talked about kind of being in the position to be the giving rather than receiving. From a Christian standpoint, the Apostle Paul says what you have that you did not receive. And there doesn't seem to be a devaluation of receiving as such. There seems potentially to be an affirmation of dependence as simply true to our human condition and the any attempt to kind of claim a staunch independence would be sinful pride. So would it be enough simply to push on that and say, you know, gratitude as I said is fine. We just need to rid the sense of indebtedness of its of its stigma. And it, it and if that wouldn't be enough, why not? Yeah. Well that's a good question. Why not just be happy with indebtedness and think of it just kind of flip the valence on it so that it becomes something we claim as a fortunate thing rather than an unfortunate thing. So I mean, there's a sense in which talking about debt obligation in terms of what we owe to one another in virtue of having received from others, it's hard to get away from using economic language to talk about that those relations, even the language of owing. But what's interesting, if we invert the values of debt obligation, then, then we may just simply be undermining the economic metaphor as it actually is. You know what I mean? So, which is great. It just, at that moment, it makes me wonder whether we're still talking about debts in the economic sense or whether we shifted the the meaning we're giving to debt in the first You're just trying to kind of uh, split a semantic sphere in, into two parts and have the same words do very different things in different spaces. Yeah, because the way we use the language of debt involves a kind of debt bondage. It's a kind of subordination. It's a kind of burden, like student loan debts or various other kinds of debts that we incur, credit card debt, for the, these crushing weights that... that we deal with that that are a matter of, as I say, this kind of calculation. Debts in these in that economic sense are, are always moving towards an attempt to square our account so that we don't have to be in debt anymore. And so if we talk about it in a positive sense that you're talking about, in one sense, that could be a very useful way of subverting this, uh, this uh, kind of economic metaphor and its deleterious kind of consequences. But at the same time, continuing to use the language of indebtedness continues to risk simply falling back into that that ordinary pattern of everyday life that we experience with debt. We'll be back with more in a moment. Hello, listeners. We do not want podcasting to be a one-sided conversation. So let's try something fun. In 2022, we're going to roll out some experimental segments for the show, and they involve your voice. First, we're inviting you to office hours. You have a burning question, observation, objection, or just want to know more about a topic we cover? Simply record your question with your smartphone and send us the clip by email at faith at yale.edu. This might surprise you, but a lot of professional podcasts, including ours, use smartphone audio for guests. We'll review your questions every week and include your voice on the show before we discuss, either with that week's guest or Miroslav Wolf or a friend of the Yale Center for Faith and Culture. Second, in keeping with our purpose to help people envision and pursue lives worthy of our humanity, maybe you have a way of articulating an answer to that question that's worth sharing. If so, send a two-minute clip of yourself tackling life's most enduring question. What does it mean to live a life worthy of our humanity? We'll give it a listen and then share with all the other listeners of the show. This is our way of calling out from the podcast cave in hopes of getting a response from outside the echo chamber. Happy recording, friends. Happy recording, friends. 
Now back to the show. Boy, I have a lot of questions right now. Let's say we granted for the moment that it would be salutary not to not to think about our relations of gratitude and giving on tight analogies with debt among human beings. This seems maybe plausible to me. So tell me what you think. In the case of God, there mm-hmm. seems to be an instance where how could we not talk about debt? We owe God our very lives. We owe God the creation within which we live. We owe God our salvation. So why not think about our response of gratitude towards God, primarily in terms of of a debt and the discharge thereof? So Aquinas is onto this, this idea that we have a kind of indebtedness to God that's a, that everyone has in an infinite sort of way, in an equal way, you might say. And it's just that that he takes to be gratia, and he compares this to gratitudo, which is the kind of debts we owe of, ob- of gratitude we owe to one another. And he thinks that th- these have a relationship of analogy. And what Aquinas means is a special sense of analogy in which he means that the situation we have in relationship to God is one that that is uh, unique in a way, perhaps ineffable and comprehensible in a certain kind of way, but that there's a kind of version of it that's close enough for us to have some grip on what it is that goes on with God, but in a way that's suited to us and our capacities for understanding and whatever. And so you can think about gra- our form, human gratitude, and that hierarchical form of gratitude that we have to sort of abide by as kind of an, a, a, a kind of small picture of the kind of gratitude that we all owe to God. But you can see that for at least Aquinas, the relationship between our, all of us in debt to God and our debts to one another, because they're analogous, because they map onto each other in a certain kind of way, you almost get a kind of the function of our debts to God in for reinforcing the hierarchical human relationships that we have with one another. So what you're suggesting is, hey, maybe let's cut off the analogy and say that there's something uh, different about all of us in our relationship to, to God. We all owe God a debt of gratitude. And then we can just sort of think of our own relationships of gratitude in ways that are not hierarchical in that way. Yeah, yeah. Let's explore that line of thought. What do you, what do you think of it? Yeah. I, what I like about Aquinas is that he wants to see divine grace and divine love in relationship and divine giving in relationship to creatures and creaturely love and giving in relationship to one another as analogous. I like that. I think that's great. I just think it's a bad analogy when you do it on those economic terms. So, so I can actually start the other direction and say, well, when we think about God's relationship, the way that God's relationship to humans and, uh, works with debt language, I would echo what Jeremy David Engels says in his book, The Art of Gratitude, which is that Christianity, he says, is at, at its most powerful and beautiful when it wages war on worldly debt. And so he goes on to talk about the prophetic tradition, about debt slavery in Amos 2 and, and God's cancellation of debt. Uh, about Jesus and Jubilee and thinking about God's canceling of all human debts in relationship to one another. And then in Paul, in in Romans uh, 13, saying, owe nothing to one another but to love one another. And so to think about this kind of debt cancellation picture of mutual dependency that we get in what God wants for us, we can ask the question about what picture of God's relationship to us is worthy of an analogy to that kind of uh, sh- divine sharing that God wants us to have with one another. And I just worry that the economic metaphor doesn't convey the notion of sharing and generous giving in the same way that being placed in a debt does. And so there's other I mean, one question asked, therefore, are there other ways of thinking about about our relationship to God, our gratitude to God, other than a kind of infinite debt of that kind? And I said, I think that there probably are other ways, that there are actually other ways of thinking about that. Do you have hunches about what they are? (laughs) Yes. So here, I, I think that there's the Christian mystical tradition is very helpful in thinking about a kind of model of God's relationship to the world as actually a kind of divine sharing of God's self. God is manifest. God's mind and will is kind of manifest in and through creaturely things. And so what it is to be a creature is to be God's gift of choosing to be in and through 
something other than God, right? That's just what it is to be a creature. And so there's a kind of um, asymmetric dependence on God that all creatures enjoy. But that's also a sense in which God is, God's life is, is extended in creatures. So the gratitude we owe to God is, is a gratitude of a kind of acknowledgement. We don't owe God a token return benefit. Rather than benefactor, or beneficiary, benefit kind of relations, God is this transcendent and holy other. And what God gives creatures that merits our gratitude is manifestations of God's self, exercises of divine wisdom and power that are experienced as the kind of mysterious and surpassing goodness and beauty of creation. And to be a grateful recipient is not a, to be a beneficiary of some kind of super erogatory going over and above what God owes to us, but it's rather a, a divinely intended witness. We're kind of a witness and channel of God's holy presence. And so vitality, the movement of God in creation is the, the kind of experience of God's life coming to itself in the life of creation. And so to acknowledge to God our appreciation for God's sharing is a kind of gratitude. So it's kind of thinking about acknowledgement and appreciation rather than debt. That's actually strikingly close to some ways I've been thinking about gratitude to God myself recently in, in Miroslav here at the center too. We've used the phrase joyful recognition. Yes, but it's one's return to God. It's not just like in contained in you. It's a joyful recognition that one offers. And that's why I think gratitude and praise go together so yes. closely in in Christian theology, or at least ought to, because I don't I feel at least, I don't know if I can totally work this out and, and really give a good, strong <laughs> argument for it, that there's something importantly different between saying, I owe it to God to praise God's goodness and saying, wow, it's only right. How could I do otherwise than give thanks and praise to the one who has created and loved this into being me, yeah. <laughs> me in this, and that that might be the kind of fundamentally appropriate creaturely attitude. And so it's not kind of totally outside the world of obligation, but it feels to me like it's got a different tenor. Does that land with you? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Both the critique and the alternative that I'm talking about, I drive from Abraham Joshua Heschel and from Howard Thurman. Thurman says that gratitude is like a sacrament. It's a sacrament. And, and Heschel talks about it like a window, like something that points us to the grace of divine manifestation. And so rather than token benefits, it's like a glad offering of acknowledgement and I think of the, the image that comes to my mind is like a reflective surface offering light back to its source. It's that kind of image. And so there is a different tenor and posture that, than that uh, obligation. I got a, another Graeber quote. He says, what could possibly be more presumptuous, more ridiculous than to think it would be possible to negotiate with the grounds of one's existence? Of course it isn't. Insofar as it is indeed possible to come to any sort of relation with the absolute, we are confronting a principle that exists outside of time or human scale entirely. Therefore, as medieval theologians correctly recognize, when dealing with the absolute, there can be no such thing as debt. Yeah, that it's just, it's kind of a category mistake. I, exactly. I think you get maybe an echo of this in one of my favorite scriptural passages that I think is about gratitude, which is where Jacob is on a journey back to his grandfather Abraham's homeland. And he sees this vision. That's the famous Jacob's Ladder mm -hmm. vision. And he wakes up and he says, surely the Lord is in this place. And I did not know it. And he calls it Bethel, the house of God. And then presumably he goes back to sleep because it says he rose early in the morning and he took the stone that he'd put under his head and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on top of it. And he makes a vow to God at this place. And he's, he says, basically, uh, God, if you make this journey a success so that so that I can get to where I'm going and make it back home to my father's house in peacefully and safely, then I'm going to set up a temple here. And then he says... And of all that you give me, I will surely give one-tenth to you. Mm. 
And the Graeber quote you just read makes me think of that. Because how utterly ridiculous a deal is that for God? Um, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's absurd. Jacob says, okay, you give me everything. I'll give a tenth back to you. Okay. And if this were a kind of an exchange calculus, God would be out nine tenths of what God had given Jacob. <laughs> so, and that is just not a good deal to take. I mean, right. does it doesn't matter what your other options are. Surely you can do better than a nine tenths loss, which must mean that God isn't dealing in terms of losses yeah. and gains here. Yes. That whatever God's relation to Jacob is, is God's covenant faithfulness, something different. And so at some level, the kind of ridiculous tokenness of what Jacob and then and this echoes then in some of the uh, the first fruits offerings of the people of Israel mm-hmm. later on. The ridiculous tokenness is at some level an acknowledgement that it's not about paying back. That exactly. This isn't exactly. a debt, that there's something else going on, that that it's yep. that as creatures. I mean, ideally, I think joyfully recognizing the goodness of the God who who loves them. Yeah, I'll think about the Mount of Transfiguration. They said, "Let's set up some booths." Let's, it's like a, <laughs> it's kind of a. There's a glad acknowledgement and response that aims to reflect back to God the experience of reception that receptivity that one has has encountered. And so there's an intrinsic relationality to it that can't be abstracted from that kind of context of relationship. It's what it's a. Um, it's and that directedness, that relational directedness of recognition is what is what we can think of as a kind of sacrament. So I'm reminded in this way of thinking about gratitude to God of the Eucharistic prayer in many traditional Christian liturgies in a kind of old fashioned English uh part of it goes like this. The the officiant says, Let us give thanks to the Lord our God, and the people respond, It is meet and right so to do. And I think that old word meat might get at the kind of thing that we've been talking about here. It's kind of fitting and proper and precisely it it fits it exactly. Mm. We started this conversation to kind of bring it around full circle by thanking each other. And yeah, sure, that's a kind of a pro forma thing to do, but I'm genuinely grateful to have this conversation with you. And I suppose a good closing question would be this. If the meatness of joyful recognition is something closer to a proper way to think about gratitude to God than debt obligation. What implications does that have for how we should talk about and how we should live within our gratitude relations to one another? Yeah, I I think the contrast from the economic picture to think sacramentally like this really has to do with recognizing the difference between the kind of encouragement towards a hierarchical picture of bondage of inferiors to superiors, that picture, versus one of mutual sharing, glad sharing in the gift of one another to one another that we get in the image of the Eucharist, even. And, and Jesus is sharing with us and our sharing with one another that we get in this, even the celebration of the Eucharist. I mean, I think of the picture in that Paul gives when he talks about rebuking the Corinthian church for eating and drinking unworthily. And what he means when he talks about their eating and drinking unworthily, the body of Christ is he sees that the same hierarchical class structure that exists in Roman society is just being mirrored in the way that they celebrate the Eucharist so that some people are coming and sitting at privileged seats at the table and some people are outside not even eaten and the sharing in the body of Christ and the celebration of thanks to God for God's gifts to us in and through Jesus is a sharing that is not with the kind of mutuality that God expects for people and the means and mode of gratitude that we give to God in our sharing with one another is not being respected. And this, Paul says, is not only to eat and undrink unworthily, but to blaspheme the, the Eucharist. And so there's a sense in which the substitution of economic forms of gratitude of economic neoliberal capitalist forms of gratitude for Christian gratitude is a, is a blasphemy. I think Eugene McCarraher talks about this in the Enchantments of Mammon, that without faith in the sacramental nature of the world, we anchor ourselves in the illusory and inevitably malevolent apparatus of domination. And, and so I think that there's something about the Eucharistic picture And what it encourages us to think about God's relation to us and our relations to one another has a a more intrinsically, you might say, egalitarian dimension to it that we can uh, attempt to live into 
And this I, I might add by way of closing is a place where where you can make that sacramental appeal without having to, to push on it too far and too hard because Eucharist simply means thanks. So it, it is a very proper place to go to think about mm-hmm. our thanksgiving to God and and then what that means for our lives with one another. So it is meet and right that I close here by saying thank you again, Samir. I've really enjoyed this conversation. Likewise, thank you. Too. For the Life of the World is a production of the Yale Center for Faith and Culture at Yale Divinity School. This episode featured theologians Samir Yadav and Ryan McAnally Lins. Production assistance by Martin Chan, Nathan Jowers, Natalie Lamb, and Logan Ledman. I'm Evan Rosa, and I edit and produce the show. For more information, visit us online at faith.yale.edu. New episodes drop every Saturday, sometimes midweek. If you're new to the show, welcome, friend. Hit subscribe in your favorite podcast listening app, and we love your feedback. Ratings and reviews in Apple Podcasts are particularly helpful, but we're just as happy to hear from you by email at faith at yale.edu. We read each comment and do our best to respond and improve the show, bringing you the people and topics that you want to hear. And if you're a regular listener, it's a huge honor that you stick with us from week to week. So I'll ask you to step up and join us. Help us share the show. Behind those three dots in your podcast app, there's an option to share this episode by text or email or social media. If you took a brief moment to send your favorite episode to a friend or share with the world, not only would you be supporting the show, you'd be sparking up a great conversation around stuff that matters with people that matter. Thanks for listening today, friends. We'll be back with more this coming week.